Awesome. Hey, everybody. Hey. It's good to be back. I've been out in New York for the last uh, week and a half, and it's good to be back here in San Francisco uh, for our uh, first ever um, San Francisco-based uh, bi-coastal speaker series. Um, and uh, today we have an awesome, awesome, awesome uh, guest who's been a friend of matter, basically pre-matter. Pre-matter, yeah, yeah, pre totally. Pre-matter, actually. Totally. At Pascal, Mozilla, yeah. Yeah, Pascal totally Finette, yes. who um, we first met actually when I was in the, um, uh, the understand phase, actually, of building matter, which is, if you remember that, go out and talk to a lot of experts and people who've done it before. Totally. And do you remember meeting yeah, totally. in your office? Yeah, yeah, 650 Castro. Yeah. Mountain View. And you were running uh, the Mozilla Accelerator. Correct, yeah, I yeah. I forget, yeah. what was it? Uh, was Web it? Forward. Web Forward. Yeah. Um, and you had, uh, uh, I was wrestling this with this like idea of scalability, mm -hmm. I remember. And so you ran an accelerator that yeah. was like, didn't have a place. Totally. Right? Totally. Um, so we were jamming on kind of the cultural implications yep. of that. And, I decided to go the other direction. But um, uh, so Pascal um, uh, is here, and um, he's going to be talking about something that's critically important, um, which he's going to call the field guide to exponential thinking. And I'm going to say is all about the top down. Remember, here at <coughs> Matter, you need to build top down trends, bottom up point of view, minimum viable product with a way to make money. Um, a way to, to defend your business model and a growth hypothesis and all wrapped in a story. And so we are uh, starting our fourth week here at Matter um, and they are driving towards Design Review 1, which Yay. is all about uh, top-down trends and a bottom-up point of view. So awesome. we thought, what better speaker to bring cool. in than, than to talk about exponential thinking in the top-down. So um, here's how today's going to work, everybody. So um, <coughs> Pascal actually has a a uh, 60-minute presentation on exponential thinking, which is awesome. Um, so we're going to dive into that in a second, and we're going to leave 15 minutes at the end for Q&A between both coasts, and we'll go back and forth between the coasts. Um, but first, let's learn a little bit more about Pascal, and we're going to do that by um, asking you to illustrate your drunken walk. <laughs> sure. Right? We, you know us. Totally. We talk about the drunken walk oh, yeah. of the entrepreneur. All the time. Um, uh, success and innovation doesn't uh, happen with a perfect plan. Totally. Uh, it totally. happens with uh, taking little steps, making little bets, and adjusting along Absolutely. the way. 100%. So I'm, I'm really interested in like, what the nodes of your drunken walk sure. look like. So totally. That's my tell point. us your story through your drunken walk. OK. So um, let's see. So born in Germany, right here, um, built my first company out of college. Uh, this was during the first dot-com boom, and to give you an idea, Single founder, two-page business plan, two and a half million dollars later. So that was the time. It's um, that easy. Yeah, no. <laughs> literally it was that easy. That thing was called Oil on Mars, which gives you an idea how stupid it was. Actually, it fits into your accelerator. We did uh, greeting cards, electronic greeting cards as a service. So at one point, we powered the greeting card section for Yahoo in Europe. So we were fairly successful, but then the dot-com crash happened and basically wiped us out. Um, from there, I uh, went to a little-known company called eBay. Um, which at the time was small in Germany, was one of their first 100 employees and did business development for them across Europe, um, which was super interesting because the thing I learned there was how do you scale, like rapidly scale a company and how do you deal, how do you live in a company which rapidly scales because it, it's so interesting when you can't see actually trends in the data because like everything just goes up and you have no idea if like the stuff you do like contributes positively or negatively. Um, I left eBay to go to a Raleigh-based company called Channel Advisor, uh, which is now publicly traded, uh, and did merger and acquisition for them. There I bought uh, three companies in Europe. One I ended up running, which I didn't like, uh, so I left. Um, started a consulting business, uh, which was called Electronauten, where we helped companies uh, go international. Uh, learned that I don't like consulting businesses. I really hate it. So I sold that company. Um, took some of that money and turned it into a, uh, a venture fund, which we called Founders Link. Um, so I'm now in Berlin. Founders Link was early stage e-commerce based companies. We had about $20 million in, in assets. So we invested, um, I brought that uh, fund to the UK. I married a Brit, um, not related to the fund. We brought this to London. 
Um, while I was running the fund, I realized I don't want to be a venture capitalist because I find this also like not particularly interesting. Um, I'm much more an operational person. Uh, from there, I got recruited by a company called Mozilla, which at the time was one of the hottest properties on the planet. Um, 400, when I joined, we had 300 million users and about 100 people staff. Um, open source, massive community effort, super exciting, and they brought me to Silicon Valley. So about eight years ago, I came here uh, to run innovation at Mozilla, and then uh, Corey and I met when we, out of that innovation department, we started an accelerator and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, I believe when Corey and I met, we were at half a billion users, um, so like just crazy, crazy user growth. I remember walking into the office in, um, uh, in Mountain View, and my boss comes to me and is like, Okay, so you know one of like, you know, the first hundred-ish people. He has three million users, don't screw them up. So, <laughs> that was fun. Um, from there, I went to another uh, institution here, Google, um, and I joined them on the Google.org side uh, with a mandate to uh, invest into nonprofits leveraging technology to solve the world's biggest problems. At Google, I learned that I absolutely adore and love Google. I can't work in large corporations. It just, I could not work there. So 90 days later, I quit. <laughs> and then uh, decided I want to go to a place called Singularity University, which is what I'm going to tell you uh, today about. Probably what's interesting is, so it's kind of like looks like a, a wonderful like resume. And when you look at my, my CV, it looks really awesome. But to, to your point about the drunken walk. So first of all, I believe I've got ADD, and thus my attention span is super short. So I leave companies when I think I've learned enough about them, which typically isn't true, by the way. Like, I always continuously discover that I know nothing, but I feel like I know something. Um, secondly, this makes all super sense when I tell you that story. I mean, I'm, I drew it as a nice graph. It never made any sense when, like, I was in the moment. So um, when I quit Google, I didn't have a job. I was basically just saying, like, I can't do this anymore. Just, like, leave. Um, when I decided to go from Founders Link to Mozilla, I left basically all my, my money and my shares on the table because it was like in a vesting period. Um, it never made any sense whatsoever. And then I also did some crazy stuff. So when I was at Google, um, we started something called the Coaching Fellowship, um, which is now a la together with my wife, which is one of the largest nonprofits um, supporting young women in leadership positions with um, pro bono executive coaching, um, which is now taking up basically a, a good chunk of our lives and is really successful. Uh, when I was at here, uh, at um, Electronauten, we started an art gallery uh, in Berlin, which became, for a very short period of time, one of the hottest art galleries in Berlin, um, just because we can, and Berlin is cheap, and you do this. And my wife has a background in art, so I thought it was a fun idea. So kind of like, it was a pretty drunken yeah. walk. I think that the really important thing is, like, it never makes a lot of sense in the moment. Like, I think I always went to, like, just what the gut and... I have a strong learner's mindset. I want to grow by learning, so I always like seek out stuff which flexes that particular muscle. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. Right. And then what about the, the, the heretic? Oh, the heretic, yeah. Uh, so I, st I started writing a daily newsletter. Uh, so when I was, there's an interesting story. So when I was at Mozilla, I started writing on a, on a blog. That blog got syndicated onto something called Planet Mozilla, which is basically all the leadership team of Mozilla gets syndicated in one blog feed, which made me realize I cannot swear on that blog. Like, I can't write, you know, the F word, because, like, literally, there's, like, the Wall Street Journal reads that freaking thing, right, to figure out what's happening at Mozilla. So I started a private newsletter. I was just, like, invited 50 friends and said, like, hey, I'm, I'm writing about, like, what I'm learning about entrepreneurship, and I, I want to write this in a very authentic way. Um, and that thing that grew, like somewhat grew over the years to like a couple ten thousand people, which is now a really nice community. And I'll give you the link later. Um, and it's just like super fun. It's now like four ish years, 800 posts. Um, it's a really cool community around it. Like they do meetups and like all kinds of stuff. Um, it's like totally random. It's just like for me. And what it does to me today is so I write every two days a newsletter thing, like fairly short. Um, what it allows me to do is really fascinating. It forces me to think about stuff I'm picking up in conversations or read. So when we have a conversation, for example, like there's something which sticks in my head, and I'm using the newsletter to kind of digest this. It's a really interesting, became an interesting habit for me to like really dig deeper into yeah. certain topics, and it seems to be somewhat helpful for people. Oh yeah, and then I buy. The, so this is heretic here, and then when I was at Google, I started guy. Well, sorry, somewhere here. 
I started something which is called Gaishido, um, which is uh, together with Daniel Epstein, who's the founder of the Unreasonable Institute, uh, we got pretty drunk and talked about like what are our like superpowers. And we both said like it's about getting shit done, right? I love just doing things. So we started out writing, fleshing out a manifesto of getting your shit done, uh, which became Gaishido. And uh, so it has like seven points and it's like fairly simple, but it's really like what is really important for us for getting shit done. And again, like as a joke, right? We're, I'm like, Gaishido is super cool. Like we registered the domain, so gaishido.com, put it on the website, and then like suddenly hundreds of people like find this shit, right? And start sending me emails like, this is so amazing. And I created a poster out of it. Then a design agency out of Boulder, Dojo4, like comes to us and said like, hey, your website stinks. We love your Gashido thing. We designed you this poster. And they designed this amazing poster with these like robot creatures on it. So <laughs> it's pretty wild. Like the world is a really interesting place. If you put out amazing stuff, like this is Seth Godin. Like if you put out amazing stuff into the world, the world has a really interesting way to rally around you and do crazy stuff with it. And, Super fun. And you can never get that unless you take the steps and oh, yeah, the totally. leaps along the way, even totally. if it doesn't make sense looking forwards, yep. but, um, but you have faith that it will make sense Absolutely. looking backwards. Yeah, totally. Uh, as well, and then one other thing I want to point out is, uh, you know, I, I tell our entrepreneurs they're leading tribes, Yeah. right? I mean, oh, it seems absolutely. like you are definitely leading your own, your own type of tribe here. Oh, right? you always have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, you either, so here's the thing, right? Like I think you either lead a tribe or you, you support a tribe and make that tribe big. Mm. So this goes to the, like there's this really cool TED talk about the, the dancing man. I don't know if you've ever seen mm. it. So this is ra random, like you should check this out. There's this random video of this, this guy um, who's dancing on his own at a music festival. Oh, yes. Like a spast. Like he's like totally crazy, right? And it's really funny because you see him, first you see him dance and then like nothing happens. And then like someone else comes and starts dancing like a crazy person. And then suddenly the whole hill basically comes and like everybody starts dancing. And a dude did a voiceover about this and like pointed out how important the second person is. Because the single person dancing doesn't do anything, but like two people, it starts to get a tribe, right? Yeah. So as you're building your tribe, either as you're joining or building your tribe, I think it's super important to figure out like who are these like the number two, number three, number four, and like how do you encourage them and how do you support them and nurture them? Because they're actually more important than you are. Thank you for sharing yeah, your of course. walk. Now, let's talk a little bit about where you should play yeah. in that drunken walk. Um, and. Uh, and talk about top-down trends and exponential thinking. So, Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So um, first of all, super, super honor and pleasure to, uh, to be here with you guys. What I want to do is for the next about 60-ish minutes, um, so we have run an executive program at Singularity University, which is about a week long, cost you $15,000, amazing, sold out for a year in advance. This is that program in 60 minutes for free, right? So <laughs> brace yourself. Um, and really, the, the starting point for me is like there's these questions which people typically have about like when you think about technology, like what is coming next? Like how do you disrupt? How do you not get disrupted? Um, and what are the, the big trends we're seeing? So really, if you like condense this down, and this is what I want to talk to you about, is like what is happening in the world? Um, how do you make sense of that change? And why does it even matter? Before we get there, very briefly, um, Corey already mentioned, I work at a place called Singularity University. It's an interesting place. Uh, we are a mission-driven organi mission organization. We have what is called a B Corp. And our mission is very simple. It's to educate, inspire, and empower leaders, like people like yourself, to apply exponential technologies. This is what we're spending the bulk of our time on today, to address humanity's grand challenges. So really to a point, to a bigger point of like fixing the world's biggest problems. Um, so we'll spend a bit of time on that as well. Um, if you ever want to follow me, like I'm very, very public. Also, you can have the slides afterwards. There's a link at the end, so you can download the slides, etc. So let's talk a little bit about like what is happening in the world of technology and to really understand the future and predict the future. And I love what the uh, the team in um, your team in, in New York is doing about like the, the the science fiction part of it. I fundamentally believe you have to understand the past first. Uh, and L.P. Hartley once said, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. And I want to start out with a story. This is the story of Xerox, Xerox Park to be precise. So Xerox Park is, well, from here it's about, what, 30 miles um, south in Palo Alto. And Xerox is an interesting place. Xerox Park was an interesting place because in the late 60s, early 70s, Xerox Park, the team over there, they were a research organization. 
The team over there invented roughly 50% of what is the core technology of what makes the internet today. They invented laser printing, which kicked off the desktop publishing revolution and changed media forever. They uh, developed Ethernet, which became the de facto standard for networking, and most notably, probably, the graphical user interface, so the thing which makes your Mac or your, your PC run. The way they could do this is, um, and this is one of their uh, key instigators, Alan Kay once said that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I believe there's something really interesting in there. So uh, this is twofold. The first one is, if you want to create a future, a particular future, if you have a vision for a future, it's on you to invent it. Secondly, if you're not doing this, you'll become a passive player in the world. So I believe that to be fundamentally true. Secondly, this is, if you use this as a mantra, you can actually invent the future. And here's how this works. This is Alan Kay, 2008, holding up a computer called the Dynabook. So this is two years before Apple introduced the iPad. This is a, a folio computer, has a little keyboard, as you can see, touchscreen display, um, really like the spiritual um, predecessor to the iPad. Now, this is two years before Apple introduced the iPad, so it's not, you know, it's curious, probably, but not like world changing. What's more interesting is in 1972, Alan Kay wrote a 30-page paper describing this computer in great detail. So there's a 30-page paper. It's now in the public domain. You can see it, where he describes in great detail how this computer should look like. Now, there's no way on, on hell you can actually build this computer in 1972. Lots of these components were too big. Uh, computers were room full of electronics, not little book-sized computers. A lot of the, the actual components weren't even invented. So touchscreens, for example, flat panel touchscreens didn't even exist. But what Alan Kay could do is he could look at the past. He could look at the last 10-ish years of computing and make a prediction that in the future we will be able to do this. What's even more interesting is when you read the paper, is he describes the use case of this particular computer. Anyone has kids here? Of course. Um, so if you have kids or you observe kids, and you see them see like parents and they have an iPad or like in t generally the tablet, I can guarantee you they're not using it because kids are using it. And he's, he's already predicting that. He's basically saying this is the perfect form factor computer for a kid because it's so much more natural. So again, like the interesting part here is like if you observe the past, you can actually extrapolate into the future. And I will tell you why this is important in a minute. This took Alan K 40-ish years to realize. That time frame shrinks down to years now. Let me uh, play a short clip. This is Alan Kay uh, a couple of years ago at the demo conference saying some interesting, uh, some very interesting short remarks. So on the other hand, he spent roughly two to three times the person's salary each year just on technology for that person. Because we we're buying, so I'll show you, we bought our way into the future. Because Moore's Law says that if you're interested in something 15 years from now, you can have that computing power now if you're willing to pay through the nose. So that's important to note. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed, as William Gibson once said. So if you're building for a future, you can buy that future today. If you want to build something for very elaborate, touch-based VR, you can buy that future. It's just expensive. So when we talk about the future at Singularity University, we talk about this notion of like Future, the future being exponential, the future of technology being exponential. And um, let me unpack this a little bit because it's kind of a weird, catchy word, but it doesn't mean a lot. Um, so if you think back to like your math class, this is a classic exponential trend. It's a doubling every time period. So go from 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, et cetera. By the way, this is also the, the graph you want to always have in your revenue predictions when you go to Silicon Valley and pitch it, right? It's the, the very famous hockey stick graph. Now, the most important trend in technology in terms of like an actual exponential is what is called Moore's Law. So Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel, 50 years ago wrote an article for IEEE magazine, interesting enough, observing the past, writing that in the last 10 years we have seen a doubling of transistors per square inch on an integrated circuit. Thus, I predict this being true for the next 10 years. So now two things happen. The first is they moved the one year to two years, so it's a doubling every two years. Secondly, this has been true for 50 years. What this means in very simple and layman terms is your computer gets more powerful, very obviously. To make this a little bit more tangible, look at this guy. So this is ASCII RED. This was the first computer to break through one teraflop, so one trillion floating point operations per second, so super fast. 
Cost $55 million, was commissioned for Sandia National Lab, where they used this to do atomic weapon testing and weather forecasting. $55 million. Nine years later, Sony releases the PlayStation 3, $499 at Best Buy, 2.1 teraflops. So within nine years, you go from something you used to model atomic weapons to something your kids now play to nuke the planet on the screen for 499 bucks. This is what exponential technologies do to you in terms of like the, the price performance ratios you get. You take this a different direction, you take a Pi Zero. This came out last uh, December, so it's about a, close to like eight, nine months old. Five dollars. This computer has 191 megaflops. By the way, this thing is a full-scale computer. This is like you plug in a monitor and a keyboard, and it's a real computer. So for the price of a Venti Starbucks latte, you get the raw compute power of two and a half Cray-1 supercomputers. The Cray-1 was released in 1975. It was the most important supercomputer of its time. One of those has more compute power than NASA had total to put the man on the moon. So the price of a Venti Starbucks latte, you now get twice, two and a half times the compute power NASA had to put the man on the moon. You take this a step further and you come to this. This is fairly old, actually. This is a freescale computer. You see a golf ball, the dimple in a golf ball, you see the little chip. That chip has the raw compute power of an early stage Pentium processor. Two millimeters by 1.6 millimeters cost you 75 cents. The reason why this chip is important is very simple. Everything, everything which has an electric outlet will become smart because of this, because you get it for free. Like I have people coming to me all the time, they're like, why would I want to have a smart toaster? And I'm like, sure, I don't need a smart toaster either, but you get it for free. <laughs> also, this chip runs on the, um, the uh, battery you have in a watch for about two years, which is the reason why everything which doesn't have an electric outlet will become smart as well. You go up to Napa, where they grow wine, there's something which they call smart dust, they're literally little sensors, cost about $10. You throw them on the ground, they measure the water content in the soil, they form a mesh network amongst each other, and then report back into a cloud-based interface so that the vinter knows exactly which wine they have to, um, where they have to like, put water down and, and fertilizer. So this is gonna be the biggest computer revolution. So you talk about um, scale, we will see 25 billion of those in the next couple of years. That's it. Um, uh, uh, Gartner gives you that data as well as Intel. But it's bigger than just computing, so make no mistake, it happens in other industries as well. Let me give you two examples. This one here is gonna change our life, literally gonna change our lives on this planet, probably even more than computing. Uh, so the cost of DNA sequencing, reading human DNA, or DNA in general. The price for a full human genome. In 1999, we did this for the very first time, 2.7 billion US dollars, part of the Human Genome Project, it took us seven years of total effort, 20 years of total combined effort. In 2007, the price dropped to $350,000. This is the first time we did this commercially. So a company came out and said, we're doing this as a service. And it took a couple of uh, weeks. 2014, a company literally down the road called Illumina came out with a machine, looks like a big photocopier, sequences the human genome for $1,000. This is the fastest drop we've ever seen in any technology in terms of price performance ratio. When you map this out, it looks like this. The top part of it is Moore's law, and then something interesting happened to the technology and drops even further. Now the interesting thing is, as an entrepreneur, you should ask yourself, as a human being, you should ask yourself, where does this go? So you speak to experts and they will tell you that price goes down to pennies. Sequencing the DNA, reading DNA will become effectively free. And then you should ask yourself, what do you do with this? So one thing is, Every time you flush the toilet, your toilet will run a full genomic fingerprint on you and give you a uh, preventive health report. There's a company in Japan, Toto. They're one of the largest toilet manufacturers. They have an innovation team which, quote unquote, said, we're not in the business of building ceramics anymore. We're in the business of doing preventive health care. You take it a different this direction, like every single one of you is currently losing hairs, cells, skin cells, like the moment you leave this room, Corey and I will hoover up and run a full genomic fingerprint on every single person here. Your full DNA, just because you're sitting here. And if you don't believe me, President of the United States of America, when he travels to quote unquote, rogue states, uh, the Secret Service wipes off the glasses afterwards and they are um, hoovering up afterwards because they don't want to leave these fingerprints. If that isn't enough, let me introduce you to a friend. Um, 
out of New York. This is Heather Dewey Hawkboard. She's an artist and she does something fairly interesting. We don't know yet how our DNA might be used against us in the future. New York artist Heather Dewey Hawkboard. One artist in New York is making 3D models of people's faces, people that she's never met. She calls the project Stranger Visions. The strangers are people whose genetic material she finds on the sidewalks and subways of New York City. How much can I actually find out about you from something that you accidentally leave behind? So as you can see, we're moving very, very quickly into a really interesting new world. So Heather, don't make a, make a mistake, like Heather is a, she knows her biology, but she also runs all this in the basement of his studio in New York City. So very quickly we're moving into an interesting world. This is a company out of our portfolio. Um, this is a web-based tool to do DNA manipulation. So basically you have a web-based tool, kind of like a GitHub for DNA. Um, this tool was used to do something called the Glowing Plant Project, which was a, bil a million dollar Kickstarter. Um, what they did is they took the genetic information for the firefly, which makes a firefly glow, and put that into a plant. So the plant glows in the night. Now that's curious and fun and, you know, it's a million dollar Kickstarter. Their big plan is to turn, this, um, to turn um, trees into glowing trees, so you replace street lights with glowing, self-glowing trees. So let me show you one more example where we see an exponential drop, which will dramatically change the way we live our lives. Uh, cost of solar. So the first time, like not the first time, but in, in the uh, mid-70s, cost of solar was about $80 per kilowatt hour. The price dropped 10 years later already by factor 10 to about $10. In 2015, the price dropped to, in California to 30 cents. This is what is called parity. So that price is the exact same price you currently pay for coal. So now we're producing absolutely clean, renewable energy for the exact same price, unsubsidized, than we're producing coal. This is a tipping point. A year later, the price dropped to 3 cents. So uh, Dubai just uh, commissioned 800 megawatt um, electronic, uh, sorry, solar facility. Price goes close to three cents. So you talk to experts and they will tell you that price. If you ask, where does the price go? Because that's the interesting part. Um, a good friend of mine works at a company uh, called RWE, their largest energy producer in Europe. Their CEO fundamentally believes that in 20-ish years, latest, energy will be free, abundant and free. So we'll not pay for that anymore. What's behind that, this is again like um, a plot, so you see the price of energy dropping and you see the um, solar panel installments going up accordingly, like two exponential trends. There's something called Swanson's Law. Swanson's Law says that for every doubling in solar panels installed, the price drops by 20%. It has something to do with economies of scale and scope. So effectively, once you reach the tipping point, energy will become free. Why is this important? Because we fight wars over energy. It's crazy. We have an abundant resource which we're currently not utilizing. And we kill people over that. Um, someone did the math on that, which is really interesting. It's like, if you were to build a solar panel that size, which you see on the, on the left-hand side, where it says welt, which means world, Notwithstanding that you need to transport the energy, that's a whole different story, but that would power the whole world's energy consumption. That is all that we need. So there's a really interesting world, like if you think about it. So computers become incredibly powerful and fast, and we talk about this a little bit more. DNA, which is the building block of life, so think about like what this means for um, healthcare, for example, longevity, um, becomes effectively free to read and very cheap to write as we now have CRISPR, and energy becomes free, we are moving rapidly into a world which would, will look very different than what we have experienced today. Um, the futurist Alan Bartlett once said that the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. Let me explain this to you. I think it's really important. So there's this notion, we call this the linear exponential deception. The challenge for us is, as humans, we grew up in a world which was linear. The day has a 24-hour cycle, the week has a seven-day cycle, like the year is a 365-day cycle, like seasons come and go. It's always very, very linear. There's very few exponential trends in nature uh, which surround us, and they're typically not easily observable. So uh, cells, for example, replicating, splitting, is an exponential trend, right? They go from one cell and then, but we can't observe it. It's not obvious to us. 
which means that over the last 150,000 years, we've been conditioned to think in a linear way because that's the way the world around us moves. So imagine 30 linear steps. You take 30 steps. Super easy for you to imagine, right? Like, how far do you get? Like, you have a really good sense in your, in your inner eye to understand where this is. It's like 30 meters, 30 yards. It's probably from here to like nearly to the door. Also, if I ask you like halfway, you have a really good sense. Like, of course, it's halfway, easy. Now imagine you take 30 exponential steps, every step twice as far, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. How far do you get intuitively? Like people don't know. So you can check in with you. I will not put you on the spot here. I typically put people on spots. I will not do this. So the first answer I always get is a mile. For some reason, someone always gets to a mile. Then you've got the people in the first row. They're like, oh, I'm listening to you. It must be much bigger. It's an exponential, whatever. And they always, always, someone blurts out, oh, it's to the moon. And then you've got someone who's like, oh, it's to the sun. To both of them, I say, that's fantastic. How far is it to the moon? And nobody knows, right? So it's intuitively, it's really hard. So to clean this up, by the way, it's uh, 25 times around the planet. It's a billion meters. It's to the moon, back from the moon, halfway to the moon again. So this illustrates two things. First of all, it's really hard for us to even have an intuitive understanding how far this is. Secondly, you see what happens if you're moving a technology from a linear to an exponential. You go from 30 to a billion. To test you, imagine you take 31 steps. How far do you get? It's a trick question. Yeah, yeah it's 50 times, exactly. Exactly, because it's a doubling, right? But it's really hard, right? You have to think about it. It's not like, oh yeah, it's 26 or, you know. It's just like, shit, I need to think about it. So here's something interesting which happens in the world where our linear thinking clashes with exponential trends. So exponential trend, your linear thinking. There's three interesting points in that curve. The first one is here, disappointment, because exponentials start really slow. Disappointment is Google Glass. Anyone has, has tried out Google Glass? I know, Corey, you have. Totally. OK. So you're disappointed, right? Like, I was at Google the short period of time when we had Google Glass. I had Google Glass. I wore it for like three months while I was on campus. Here's what happens. Google Glass is too expensive. Battery life is poor. Functionality is pretty mediocre. And you look like an idiot. Every person I put Google Glass on was exactly the same person. They were always like this. They were disappointed. The challenge is if you're disappointed, you're dismissing. That is the challenge. The people I met who said, like, yeah, Google Glass isn't good. Thus, this thing isn't good, this trend, this compute, like, and then you come to the magic moment. The magic moment is when at Moscone Center, Steve Jobs gets on stage and shows the world the iPhone. And I was at Moscone Center. I saw Steve Jobs present the iPhone, and next to me, I swear to God, said this guy, and Steve Jobs shows the iPhone for the first time. Everybody's like, oh my God, this is so cool. And the guy pulls out his Nokia phone, which he, with brand new Nokia phone, $700 and literally, literally said, shit. <laughs> because you know that from that moment onwards, phones are not phones anymore, they're computers. And like the whole world has just rapidly changed. And then you come into chaos and amazement. Chaos and amazement is when you cannot keep up with the change we're seeing in the world anymore. Kenya's smartphone penetration today, 7%. In three years, 90%. In three years, every Kenyan is on the internet. Barclays Bank, biggest bank in, uh, in Africa, I met with their leadership team. They know this, they see the trend. They're literally saying, if we're not a mobile first bank in three years time, we are out of business because someone else will do it. An entrepreneur just like you will do it. Six months after I met them and talked about this, Barclays Bank announced that they're moving completely out of Africa because they think they can't do it. So here's another way to look at this, and this is more like the human factor. So the crossover point is this, is this acceptance threshold. Technology gets good enough, okay? You always, in the beginning, find people who will tell you this. This is worthless nonsense because technology is like so inferior. Then you get to this point which is like, this is true but quite unimportant. And then you come to the really important point. This is an interesting but perverse point of view. This is super dangerous. I recently sat down with a bunch of members of parliament from Germany. We talked about the autonomous car. And they we talked about how it's going to change the city. And I told them that the mayor of San Francisco, with whom I spoke, said, that they're currently looking at all the parking um, infrastructure in San Francisco and thinking how they can turn that into um, living spaces. Because you will not need as much parking infrastructure anymore. And these guys said like, yeah, that's interesting, but that's not true. And then you get to this, I always said so, right? <laughs> always. Politicians are really good at that. So the challenge is if you're staying on this, it's your certain path to doom. This is what happens to Nokia, which is like, 
largest cell phone manufacturer in the world, five years later, $700 million in losses in a single quarter and not sold a single phone anymore. So here's how this plays out. 1997, this is what I grew up with. Um, this is Deep Blue, IBM Deep, Deep Blue. First computer to beat a human in chess. Now chess is a fairly easy game for a computer to play because all you need to do is you need to calculate those moves, you calculate the next ones, and then you do basically um, probability calculations on it. What's interesting about Deep, Deep Blue is a couple of things. First is, it didn't really clearly win against Kasparov. So it, uh, uh, Deep Blue won the first game, sorry, Kasparov won the first game, Deep Blue won the second, they had a draw in the third game, and Kasparov threw the fourth game because he had nerves. So it wasn't like, you know, machines taking over. This is Deep Blue, 1998, a $100 million computer, has 11 gigaflops. This is one eighth of your iPhone. And not just like your newest iPhone, this is an iPhone 5S, which you actually have to buy on eBay these days. This single-handedly is the reason why there's not a single human being on this planet who can beat your iPhone in chess. Like game of chess has been done, it's over. Like machines have taken that over, right? So you fast forward this, you come to 2011, again IBM, bringing out a computer doing, playing what's, uh, Jeopardy. You are familiar with Jeopardy? Jeopardy is interesting because it's a Google search in reverse. I give you the question, you give me the answer. It's super, super, super hard to play because you need to have a conceptual understanding of what's happening. So this is IBM playing uh, Jeopardy. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. What do you say we play Jeopardy? Uh, let's get right into the Jeopardy round. 400, same category. This mystery author and her archaeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson? Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. Same category, 600. Okay, so this is Watson. Watson, these two guys, by the way, are the world champions in Jeopardy. They're really good. So Watson not just won a little bit, Watson utterly destroyed them. This is really interesting because that's a tipping point in terms of where we are going with uh, common knowledge artificial intelligence. And make no mistake, Watson isn't actually really smart, but Watson started doing a semantic understanding of what's happening around him in the world. You fast forward this to 2016, anyone has heard of AlphaGo? Okay, so AlphaGo is uh, Google's uh, effort to play a game called Go. I wanna quickly play a clip here. Chess number of possible moves is about 20 for the average position. A go is about 200. Another way of viewing the complexity of go is that the number of possible configurations of the board is more than the number of atoms in the universe. If you ask a great go player why they play a particular move, sometimes they'll just tell you it felt right. So you can, the one way you think of it is that go is a much more intuitive game, uh, whereas chess is a much more logic-based game. We always used to talk about, well, if we could eventually crack Go and have a program that could be the world champion, then we must have invented some generic general purpose algorithm. So maybe we're on the cusp of all of that, and we're very excited about it, but it is just one run the ladder uh, towards uh, solving artificial intelligence. So AlphaGo played the world champion um, in a five match. It won four of those. What's remarkable in match number four, move th number 38 is the one move which probably will go into the, literally into the books of history. Because what AlphaGo did was, it made a move which made the, the human player, which is this Chinese, uh, sorry, this um, uh, his Asian prodigy in, in uh, Go, go up and you play Go against the clock. So you actually, like there's a ticking clock. So he went up, he went up, left the room and stayed out of the room for 15 minutes and came back. He was so shocked. The move had a, had a winning chance of one to 10,000. It's like an absolutely, like no human would have ever played that move. It makes no sense whatsoever. And it's considered one of the most beautiful moves. It led to uh, AlphaGo winning in the end. It's one of the most beautiful moves ever played in Go, at least so say Go players. It's really interesting where we're getting towards artificial intelligence, general purpose artificial intelligence and how fast we're getting there now. Let me show you one more thing and this goes into the other way of it, which is the embodiment into, into robotics. So 2015, uh, DARPA has a robotics challenge where they basically have a bunch of robots um, perform uh, interesting tasks. So this is 2015 DARPA robotics challenge.
So as you can see, in terms of robots, we're clearly not at the Terminator stage. But you forward this to one year, and you come to Boston Dynamics, which is a company Google owns, um, and they recently released this video. So this is one year after you've seen all these little bots falling at the easiest task, like opening a door or something. Now, as you watch this, like he will perform a couple of tasks. There's an interesting part in there. So he gets pretty dexterous, can move. So now we can ask, here's, a, here's a, an interesting question for you. Who feels sorry for the robot? I do. Right? Here's the second piece. You know how they say like everything you put on the internet like will stay there forever? So in 20 years when the robots rise, <laughs> if I were this guy, I would wear a mask and surely I would not wear my badge on my hot trousers, okay? But so you get the idea, like do you see where we're getting with computers? And again, these things are, these things are like super um, experimental. You can buy for $25,000, you can buy this guy. This is a company called Rethink, uh, a robot called Baxter. What's interesting about Baxter is robots are really bad in human environments, typically, because they have no sense of what's going on around them. Baxter was built to work alongside robots, so it ha alongside humans. Um, so it has sensors, et cetera. When you walk into his arms, like it pulls back the arms, gives you a little frown. Also, the way you program Baxter is you put it into programming mode and you show him what you want him to do. You literally take his little arms and show him what you want to do. Now the question you can ask yourself, and this is a really interesting sociological question uh, or societal co question, is like, so $25,000, if, if you need someone who packs, for example, would you hire a human? Or would you get this guy, like seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, right? So we're moving into a really interesting uh, world. So here's your like, first summary. This, I cannot stress this enough how important this is. Once a technology becomes digitized, it moves on an exponential curve. So once a technology becomes from something which is analog into something which is digital, it automatically moves onto an exponential curve, which is to say if you turn this around, as an entrepreneur, if you find analog businesses and you turn them digital, these are the biggest business opportunities in your lifetime. So. So here's how you make sense of this change. You've seen like, okay, so these exponential trends are real, like we see this in technology. How do you make sense as an entrepreneur? And I've got a couple of points on this. The first is like, let's talk a little bit about what uh, our co-founder Ray talks about, the law of accelerating returns. And I need to do this as a full disclaimer because exponentials are not exponentials, they're S-curves, right? So you take something like uh, Moore's law, for example. Moore's law will flatten out. We will come to a point where the transistors will become so small that we're getting to subatomic and it doesn't work anymore. So what um, Ray did, he was very interested in this phenomena and said like, okay, what does this actually mean in a longer, longer term period? So Ray took something called calculations per second per $1,000, which is the economic underlying part of Moore's law. How many calculations can I perform per one second if I were to spend $1,000 of that year's money? And look, the black points are uh, actual data points and looked at data points across 110 years. And what he saw is that these trends stay absolutely tr stable. Um, this is a, um, a logarithmic plot, which is the reason why you see it like as a, as a linear graph. And here's the underlying part. So as we discussed, like these things are S-curves, sigmoids. What happens is once a technology starts to flatten out, it gets replaced by the next technology. And so these curves start to stack on top of each other and in the long run form a perfectly fine exponential curve. If you're familiar with Clayton Christensen's work, this is um, the innovator's dilemma. He just describes this from a different perspective. His perspective is to say, a company which dominates one of these eras is never the company which dominates the next. To show you this in, in real world's time, this is the, the PC market. And as you can see, like the PC market was in this like really weird, like changing market when, the, when PCs first came about. Then one company started to dominate it, which is Microsoft. And then as we're moving towards the world of uh, mobiles, um, phones and tablets, suddenly that company doesn't become dominating anymore. And like the, you come into this new world where like change happens pretty dramatically. What's interesting is A, these changes happen quicker and quicker. So what was like a 20 year cycle is now probably a five year or 10 year cycle. Secondly, every time you're at this, this infliction point where like these technologies shift, this is where you want to build your company because these are the most exciting times. This is where empires are built. 
The second thing you can do with this graph is you can extrapolate it. If you believe this graph to be true in the future, and there's no point, well, there's, there's an argument to be made to believe that, because it has been true for the last 110 years, you can actually determine the point when you have a computer which has the raw compute power of a human brain. So one computer, one human brain, which happens in 15 years. So in 15 years, someone will build a computer which has the raw compute power of a human brain. You extrapolate this further, and you get to a world where you can actually extrapolate, when do you have a computer which has seven billion brains in a single machine? which is happening in about 50 years. Here's a framework to make a little bit more sense of the change we're seeing. It's called the 60s of disruption. This comes from Peter Diamandis, one of our other co-founders. And I want to explain this to you by talking about the first digital camera. Um, this guy is called uh, Stephen Sasson. He's the inventor of the digital camera. This first digital camera had 100 by 100 pixels, a whopping 0.01 mega megapixels, obviously terrible. So here's what happened. The first, he says, once a technology becomes digitized, it moves on an exponential curve. So you take something which is analog, which is film, chemical process, and you digitize it. In the beginning, it's deceptive. We talked about this earlier. The first digital camera had 0.01 megapixels. A year later, they doubled the pixel count to 0.02. A year later, they doubled again, and then it doubled again, and doubled again. When they were at 0.16 megapixels, Kodak, which was the company which invented this camera, stopped the project. They're basically saying, like, because they saw zeros in the beginning, right? It's deceptive. It's really deceptive. Eventually, they get disruptive. This is a point when you had two megapixels. Two megapixels is good enough for a 9 by 13 print in centimeters. I remember distinctly buying the Canon Digital Elf, $499, little camera. The last time I bought film. I never bought film ever again. The stuff eventually becomes dematerialized. So you take a $499 camera, which is now a $1 little chip and a little bit of optics on your phone, and everything else is software, including the shutter button sound. You demonetize it. So again, like from $499 and film to $499 and no film to, well, you kind of get it for free with your phone these days. If you're splurging, you buy a fil phone photo filter app for like 99 cents. And then you democratize it. Democratization is, I think the last stat I read was 3 billion pictures get uploaded to photo sharing sites every single day. So that's basically, like there's 3 billion people on the net. So on average, every person uploads one photo to a short photo sharing site a day. You can play this with other technologies as well. It's an interesting uh, descriptive model. So you take Uber. Uber digitized the rider information. Where's the car? Where's the rider? Put it on a digital map. It was deceptive because Uber was black cars in the beginning. I remember meeting Garrett Kemp, who's a good friend of mine, uh, who's the co-founder of Uber. And Garrett told me about Uber. And I was like, dude, like, this is for you rich guys. This is not, I don't care. Then it becomes, so, so much for my ability to see the future, by the way. <laughs> then it becomes disruptive. Disruptive was Uber copying Lyft, creating UberX. Everybody's their own driver. They dematerialize car ownership. If you live in San Francisco, there's a really good chance that you don't have a car anymore. If you are a driver, you don't need a special car. You can just take the car you already have. They demonetize it. It's significant and cheaper than a cab. And ultimately, their goal is obviously put a, a person into every seat, into every car around the planet. So you democratize access to transportation. It's an interesting model. It's just descriptive, and it gives you a an, an hint of where an industry is going. You might be familiar with this. This is super important, and I find it's fascinating. Like, Corey and I grew up with this shit, and I find a lot of young entrepreneurs not knowing about this anymore. This is, um, um, Geoffrey Moore um, has got a model called crossing the chasm. It's super important. Here's the reason why. As you're moving alongside your developing curve in terms of, like, users taking your, your product, you start out with, like, the early adopters, and then you get to the majority, and then the laggards eventually, right? So this is, you guys are using it. This is like you guys and your friends are using it. This is you guys, your friends, and a whole bunch of other people start using it. This is your mom using it, and this is your grandma using it. Okay? Every time you go from one of one of these phases to the next, there's a little bit of a gap. There's a little bit of like these people want something different in the app or in your product. The most important part is here. There's a massive chasm. Early adapters to early majority. Like going from you and your friends to the people who are kind of like interested in new technology but not really there yet. And I find Silicon Valley companies missing that step regularly. It's crazy. And it drives me crazy. Here's how this looks like in life. 
This is a self-driving car. This is a Tesla self-driving car, an elderly person in that car. Okay. Oh my God, I'm gonna hit it. Oh, I, it's, it's too good. I just, you have to like drive it around. Okay, you see what the gap is? This is real. This is a dude basically putting his mom, and it, it was like, it went viral on Facebook, obviously, for obvious reasons, right? But it's a dude basically filming his mom. I ripped this off of Facebook. Here's the chasm, and like people like kind of look, glance over this. The, there is a reason why this woman will never ever buy a self-driving car because it freaking freaks her out. And I tell you what the chasm in the product is. Because I was at Google when we had Chauffeur, the self-driving car, and I used Chauffeur a couple of times. The chasm is the moving steering wheel. It freaks you out. You're sitting in a car and the steering wheel moves like magically. It's so scary. You remove the steering wheel, you cross the chasm. You build this thing, which is the, the Google self-driving car, which drives around Mountain View a lot. This doesn't have a steering wheel anymore. And then you come to this. What she really liked was that it slowed down before it went around the curve and then accelerated in, in the curve. curve. She's always trying to get me to do, do it that way. That's the way I learned in the high school drivers. So here's the thing. You have to, when you design your product, I cannot stress this enough, you have to figure out like where's the chasm in your product. And if you want to, if you want to cross into mainstream, you need to do this. You need to remove the steering wheel. I'll give you another example. This is the first um, synthetically manufactured meat. So someone took a, in, uh, this is a Dutch team, they took a biopsy of a cow, so a very small amount of actual meat, and there's a, a process to get that, coax that meat to replicate itself, and then you, you build collagen around it. This is a burger patty. The first time they did this, about four-ish years ago, that burger patty was $350,000, so not quite McDonald's value meal, right? About four, now five months ago, in Nature, the same team released their updated study. They are now building the same burger for $11. So we will have synthetic meat super quick, but it needs to cross the chasm because I can tell you what happens. I look at this and I'm like, holy shit, I want this, this is great. The vast majority of people I show this to, they're freaking out. They're like, I would never eat this, this is disgusting, right? So how do you tackle this? Like you can go into the market and you can try to brute force your way into the market and like doing marketing, education, whatever. Another way to do this is one of our companies um, based in New York, they're doing the same thing. But what they figured out is they create a product which has never existed before. They're making, their first product is a, a steak chip. So basically like a potato chip, but it's made out of protein, steak protein. That product doesn't exist in the market. So people, you give it to people, they're like, oh yeah, cool, this is great, this tastes super nice, it's interesting, it has lots of protein, blah, blah, blah. So you're crossing the chasm by rethinking, like reframing what you're actually producing. I wanna give you another uh, really important model, and this is um, uh, for all the change makers out there, it's one of the most important models. It's called uh, the Pace Layers model, and this is uh, Stuart Brand. So Stuart Brand is the guy who invented the, uh, the whole Earth catalog, which was the spiritual predecessor to the World Wide Web like a printed catalog, basically. And he's also a guy who oversees the Long Now Foundation. So if, you ha if you've not been to the, um, the interval, which is their bar, you have to go, it's amazing. So here's how this works. So what Stuart figured out is, change happens at different paces, and they layer on top of each other. So the slowest change happens in nature. The San Andreas Fault, for example, like moves about two inches a year. It's like kind of nothing, you can't even observe it. Fashion obviously moves at the fastest pace. Like fashion is like what it's the, you know, like the shirt I'm wearing today might be out of date like a week later. Interesting enough, all the attention is on the fashion layer. All the real change happens in the layer further down. Where this is really important is people try to force change at the fashion layer or commerce layer on, on layers which don't quite move as fast. So how many times have you, if you have been in like corporate America, how many times have you heard of like the, let's do a culture change initiative? 
right? Like CEO gets up and it's like, we're changing the culture. Three months later, we're gonna be like Silicon Valley. I see these people all the time. They come to our place, right? Like we educate them. They're trying to change one of the slowest moving um, layers at the pace of probably the fashion layer. Here's how this plays out. Like you take Uber. So Uber plays in the commerce layer. They change the way we think about and do commerce. And they're hitting against the governance layer. So in Uber, is in, in um, uh, I think Austin, Texas, they have taken them off the street. Um, in Paris, they burned down like basically all of Paris in, in protest. Uber is getting better that they understand it now. But initially, they were basically doing this here, and they said like, oh yeah, commerce layer, you need to move as fast, and they have not taken into account how this change trickles down. So it's a really important model to think about if you want to instigate change in the world, how these different layers operate at which uh, different paces. Let me give you one last um, model, and then uh, I want to go into the why. So this is the idea of abundance. And uh, obviously, you guys are in the media business, so you know this really, really well. Printing books is a freaking hard process. Like you take a tree, you turn it into pulp, you turn that into paper, you print stuff on it, you put it in a truck, you deliver it. So books are really uh, scarce as a resource. Now that obviously changed because digital makes everything suddenly cost of distribution close to zero, cost of replication close to zero. A scarce resource suddenly becomes abundant and changes everything we know in the world about it. Again, like this is not a surprise, like you know, Napster changed the way we think about music. There's now 14 million songs on, on Spotify, cost me 9.99, done. Before that, it was like printing CDs, shipping them around the world. You think about uh, media. My parents literally bought Encyclopedia Britannica. We still have that at home as a kind of a token thing. I mean, now like all this is, is free. What you need to figure out is, in your businesses, very realistically, the, 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 the models you are currently operating under if they're based on scarcity, you should test your assumptions because scarcity is a business model which will go away super, super quickly and will turn into an abundance model. Then the question becomes, if, if what you're doing today is abundantly available, how can you build a business on top of that? And obviously you can, Spotify does, right? Uh, these guys do, um, but you really need to think about this. Let me give you like the, my second kind of like uh, summary. Um, and this is my favorite, favorite question. So what does 10x look like? And here's how you can use this. In this world, we're really used to like optimizing the 10%, right? We're really used to thinking about like, there's this thing we have, how do we make that a little bit better? Now it's really hard to do that because we're living in a very optimized world. Everything around us has been optimized so many times that the 10% improvement is really, really hard. If you ask yourself, how do we make something 10 times as good? You're forcing yourself into a completely different plane of thinking. There's another piece in there, which is, um, I actually do this in your um, uh, design reviews a couple of times, which is like, when you go to an investor, you have a business plan and you have an idea of how much money you need. Like say you need a million dollars to build the thing. I did this when I was an investor, like all the time. So you come to me and you say like, here's a million dollars. And I'm like, that's great. I really like the team. I like what you guys are doing. I give you $10 million. What do you do? I can swear 99.9% .9 of people have no idea. They just don't know because they never ever thought about it. And it's a huge red flag for me because it, it shows me that the entrepreneur has not thought about actual scale. And typically they babble something like, oh yeah, hire a few more people, we go into more countries and so on. It's just never the answer. The flip side of that is I get these entrepreneurs, they come to me and they're like, they're really pissed about uh, Travis from Uber getting like all this money, right? Like raised $2 billion. And they're like, why does he get that money? Is this so stupid? You know, like whatever. And I'm looking at it like, because he can answer that question. Because he can tell you what he's doing with $2 billion. Do you know what you do with $2 billion? I wouldn't, it's really hard. So it's a really, really powerful question to ask yourself, like where is your business going? And even if you don't get the 10X, it allows you to think on a very different plane and think about that future. So here's why this matters. And this is what is effectively the big picture. Albert Einstein once said, we sh shall require a substantial new manner of thinking if mankind is to survive. There's a really important point in there, survival. So this is why I care about this stuff. So you take our, just a couple of points. You take our blue planet, population growth will come to about 9 billion people in 2050. This is data from the, um, uh, the United Nations. Food today is a distribution problem. There's enough food, it's just in the wrong places. And that's a hard problem to solve already. 9 billion people, so we know, need to grow ag our agricultural output by 2% every year. We're currently growing at 1%. So we will not have physically enough food on this planet to feed these people, which by the way is the reason why we need to uh, raise meat in Petri dishes. 
You take something like employment, like as a European, this is a very, uh, very hot topic for me. The World Bank came out with a report saying that we need to create 600 million new jobs in like 15 years um, to sustain globally our current employment rate. I can guarantee you it's not gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. Technology probably is a factor to accelerate this. We talk, I talk to a lot of politicians about this. I, I fundamentally believe we need to figure out like, a new way of like, living our, like, designing our society. You take global warming. Um, sea levels will rise by two meters. Um, this is an average you get from like, most experts. What's interesting about global warming, a lot of people like, misunderstand global warming. They're, they're looking at the change in weather patterns, and those are terrible, no question, like you know, more typhoons and so on. The really important piece is like the actual like sea level rise and what this leads to in terms of the displacement. So all of Bangladesh will, will be underwater. Uh, for my friends over in uh, New York, uh, all of Manhattan will be underwater. <laughs> if you want to get a sense of what that looks like, so in Europe you currently have a million people on the roads um, due to the uh, Syrian refugee crisis. Manhattan Island itself houses eight million people. So imagine these people need to move. So there's a really interesting terrible uh, threat to us in terms of mass displacement. Uh, you take poverty, the three billion people who live in less than two and a half dollars a day, you can't buy a Starbucks for less than two and a half dollars a day here in Silicon Valley. You take sanitation, there's two and a half billion people who don't have access to proper sanitation, making diarrhea the number one killer in the, in the world. 800 million people don't have access to clean drinking water, uh, one of the, the clear human rights we have, and a child dies every six seconds of malnutrition in a world where we have absolute abundance. Now here's the thing, I'm an incredibly optimistic person and I think we can solve these problems if we think big and act accordingly. And I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, this is Nithya. Nithya tackles an interesting problem in the world. Vaccines in, this, in the developing uh, world on average, on 20 to 30% of those vaccines spoil because of a break in the cold chain. So the vaccine gets too warm or too cold. In the best cases, you see it because the vaccine has a little, like the vial itself has a little marker. In the good cases, you administer a vaccine, it's ineffective. In the worst cases, you actually make the child sick. This affects millions and millions of people. What they did is they invented a little device, uh, which looks like this. And you open it up and it shows you, this is a $25 Chinese manufactured cell phone. Um, Android uh, is a 25 cent little uh, custom made piece of hardware and it has a temperature sensor. You put all this together in a little uh, Pelican case, you bolt this thing onto the fridge, it travels with the fridge. Now it does a couple of things. The first is it measures the temperature and gives the nurse in the field a text message which says that you know, if the uh, fridge was effective or not, if the temperature was in the, the range. Secondly, it, because it's a connected device, it sends this up to the cloud and now you can see where these, these incidents happen. And uh, typically they happen in the same places all over the time. So here's, here's the reason why I'm so optimistic about the future. So Nithya came to me with this thing. Uh, I was at Google um, when I first met her. Since then she has rolled this out in six countries plus India. Obviously India is a country, but big. By the end of this year, they're gonna be in every fridge in India. So they're currently deploying 25,000 more devices. They already have deployed 20, uh, about 15,000 of those in India. In every single country where Nithya is, the problem is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. And here's the reason why I'm so optimistic. Every single person here in this room can build this. This is not rocket science, crazy, you need to have like a double PhD from MIT. No, everyone can build this or you can know someone who can build this. This is the reason why I believe we can tackle these problems. The question I always ask myself and the question I asked Nithya when I first met her, what does it take to make the problem go away? By the way, this is also a really good business question. If you can make the problem go away for your customer, you win, you're golden. Not make it a little bit better. Don't make a little dent in it. Then you get displaced to your point about like how do you actually create a, a sustainable, defendable business model. If you make the problem go away, it's the most defendable business model you can have on the planet. I mentioned to you earlier, like my, my personal, uh, Belief is like, all I care about is my growth. I fundamentally believe that humans care about their growth. Even more so if you're an entrepreneur. This is the first page in the handbook for the US Navy SEALs. I'm a pacifist, so I happen to work with the Navy SEALs, which is crazy. But the Navy SEALs, like the most badass like military unit on the planet, the first page of it has this formula in it, which says that your rate of growth equals the magnitude of the challenge multiplied by your intensity of the attack. So if you take that 
and you take it for real, like you believe this, and I fundamentally believe this, why wouldn't you take the biggest problems and wouldn't you hit it as hard as you can? Because it's your rate of growth, it's your growth. Like there's no reason not to take the hardest problem, not to work as hard as you possibly can on it. Um, because all we care about, I care about, is human growth. George Bernard Shaw once said, and this is my last quote for today, it's like, the reasonable man adopts himself to the world, the unreasonable one persists in adopting the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. So you have to be unreasonable in this world because like, literally the progress of this world, of the world outside of these walls, depends on you being unreasonable. Um, in a lot of cases, we're here. We're somewhere at this interesting crossover point in terms of technology. Um, and I said you can have slides. There they are. Thank you. Anybody inspired? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the one slide you need to take a picture of. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I mean when I'm talking about top-down trends, making a bet on where you think the world um, is going. Um, Pascal, thank you for, mm. uh, for sharing that. Um, I'm inspired every time I hear you talk. Thank you. Um, and uh, I want to give a chance to open it up to questions, but I'm going to start with, with one question. Do you, uh, uh, how would you think of this and exponential trends in terms of uh, building a media company? Totally. Um, so I think there's a, there's a whole bunch of vectors, right? So first is, I would think about like where does technology be? Where is technology going to be in a couple of years in terms of like what you are doing, right? Like um, you had in your last batch, you had like virtual reality companies, right? I think virtual reality becomes a really interesting one. I actually think augmented reality becomes the much more interesting trend. Um, so technology moves that way. Um, you think about the power of um, computing, uh, computing power in terms of artificial intelligence, and you think about what can that do for me, right? So one of the concepts we talk a lot about and generally talked a lot about is this, this smart, intelligent assistant. So the, the idea of like, I've got these little like assistants which crawl the web for me, so news for example, right? Yeah. Like what we're currently doing I think is still a very rudimentary way of like filtering news. What I want is, a, is an agent where I'm say, find out everything you know about, I don't know, a particular incident, um, particular event in the world and come back with a summarized version of those results tailored to me. And then this, this agent will basically start ingesting lots and lots of data and then we'll come back with that information. Um, so I think we will see a lot of that stuff. Um, and then obviously the business model side, right? Like, all this is like, you know, you go back to like, uh, media is abundantly available because the distribution and the, uh, the replication of media is now free. So what does this mean in terms of like my business model? Like, uh, and we, like media has been disrupted. It was the first basically, the first bastion to fall, right? Yep. Absolutely. All right, let's turn it over to uh, questions. We've got about 15 minutes of questions. Um, and because they're joining us remotely and I don't want to forget that they're in the room, let's toss it over to New York for the first question. We are going to do the muting dance. <laughs> yeah, anyone has a question here in New York? Okay, we can hear you guys now. So I'd love to hear how you think about the idea of exponential growth and accelerated return inside of the closed system that is the planet Earth. And how do we think about those trigger points in different dimensions like water, resource, et cetera? Or do you think that you know, energy becoming free, quote unquote, uh, via solar or something else just solves all those problems. Awesome. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a, a wow. <laughs> That is an exponential echo. Um, <laughs> I think it's a really fascinating question. And uh, this warrants a very long response, which we should have over a glass of wine, I think. Um, the, the headline version of it is, I believe that uh, as has been in the past, technology will make our lives better. We're undoubtedly and undeniably living in the best times ever, right? Like least amount of wars, longest life expectancy, highest quality of life, all these factors like trend in the right direction. Um, I believe that there's, there's probably like the, the fear I have is that, that some of those um, uh, problems we're seeing in the world are probably at a little bit of a tipping point because they're moving very, very quickly you know, like climate change, for example, and they're very complex. Um, so I think that we as humans need to like rally behind them and can fix them. Um, also, uh, just make no mistake, like one of the interesting trends you see is in terms of like population growth, for example, like I showed you the nine billion people uh, number. 
Uh, most experts will tell you that number will probably flatten out at roughly 9 billion people. So it's not like the, the, the overpopulation of this planet, there's, there's reasons for it, you know, like people want to live, um, they have less kids in like developing country, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, overall I'm hopeful and I think we've got our work cut out for us. San Francisco. Shoot. Um, so I've been making this exponential growth case in all kinds of things and all kinds of fields for a long time with a lot of people I've been working with too, partly because Ray is Ray Kurzweil, correct? Right? Yeah. yeah. So because I read a bunch of the stuff that mm -hmm. he's written and um, I've also talked to Jerry Kaplan at Stanford mm -hmm. before and the one thing that people always say when I talk about uh, Ray Kurzweil is that he keeps on pushing that date when you, when you leave old, sure. you know, when, when the computers are Mm -hmm. He keeps on pushing that date back, they say. Mm -hmm. um, what is your response? I mean, I guess kind of to that in, 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 in the case of Ray Kurzweil, but also sure. to all the progress. Because I, I, I agree, I think there is all that exponential growth, but um, you know, when I talk to my dad, he always says, well, you always look back to the past to make these arguments. What if just all of a sudden the path is not the indicator anymore? Okay, so, and let's yeah, uh, yeah, we'll no, repeat totally. the questions because yeah. I'm not sure if uh, New York can hear. So, Ray Kurzweil keeps pushing the date where uh, yeah. the, the singularity back. What, is, what does yeah. that mean? Right. Um, does that matter? Yeah, right. So, uh, for the last couple of years at least, Ray has been very consistent in like predicting like the date. And you can argue if, like, you know, if the date is the right date. I think that's a mute argument. I think that's actually the wrong question to ask. I think the bigger question to ask is, this is gonna happen, like no matter what. If that happens in like 15 years or 17 or 20 years, it doesn't really, like that doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. I think the bigger question to ask is, how do you leverage this to do good? And what does it mean for us as society, humans, organizations, et cetera, right? And I think that's the, the more, in my view, is like the more important um, question. I'm, moderately skeptical of some of the dates which have been thrown around um, in terms of like I think they're probably overly optimistic um, but again like at the same time like if I see AlphaGo like destroying a human in, in Go which like you know three years like three years ago nobody would, would have thought about um, and the more poignant one for me is like if you think about like how old the iPhone is it's just a couple of years old and like see what it did in terms of change smartphones in general, right? Like change to the way we live our lives, we like consume media, like that's pretty dramatic, like really dramatic, right? So I think it's, you know, now you can argue like, could have that happened in like a five year or a seven year or 10 year spine? It just doesn't, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think it matters all that much. But yeah. Let's go back across the country in our exponential leap over there. Hi, um, at Matter, we uh, kind of are sitting at the intersection of design thinking and entrepreneurship and media. And design thinking is the, the tool and process by which we develop our products and our business. Um, you've kind of made a case for um, thinking massively about the world and exponentially. At Singularity, what are the types of tools and processes that you guys use with the businesses that you work with, whether that's startups and like, what does that look like when you try and take this hour and turn it into the next year, two years, five years, like actually like in that slower circle of culture? What does this look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm. Awesome. So yeah. how does the rubber hit the road at yeah, Singularity? Yeah, totally. I think it's a, this is a really awesome question. I think it's a really fascinating question. So we do a lot of design thinking. Um, so we have a modified version of the design thinking framework, which we call Design for Exponentials, but it's basically the same thing and just like a different branding, so we can sell it. Um, <laughs> as you have to. Um, so we do a lot of design thinking. I think the, the most important part is like, and you, I know you preach this, is really understanding what the actual problem is. Like deep, 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 deep getting into the problem space. And then the other thing we're doing is, um, uh, on the other extreme, we do this moonshot thinking. So it's like really like encouraging and helping people to think 10x, right? Like what does the, the future look like? And really force them to do, also do the math on it, right? Like uh, one thing, again, like, trying to overcome this linear exponential deception and saying, okay, so if I build something which is based on, let's like, say, computational power, really understanding, like, where is that computational power in, like, two years, four years, five years, 10 years, 
also thinking about like where is this technology, where am I today? How long does it take me to hit the market? And then projecting out like where is technology when I hit the market? So what do we actually need to build for? Um, I've got an interesting example for this, which is uh, the self-driving car. So Google self-driving car, um, uh, when Google first developed this uh, as Project Truffer, uh, it relies on a, on a thing called a LiDAR, which is a three-dimensional radar. It's the spinning radar, basically. When Google did this the first time, like the first car, uh, the unit was the size of the roof and was about $80,000. And they showed this to a whole bunch of car manufacturers. And they, like, the car manufacturers looked at it and said, like, this is too expensive, it's ugly, like, nobody would buy this, right? What Google could do, though, is they could take this, this atomic unit, not this the whole car, like it's really hard to predict where's the self-driving car in 10 years, but you can take the atomic unit of the LiDAR and say, where does LiDAR go in 10 years, right? So the unit they have today on the cars is the size of a football, costs about $8,000. The unit they will have in a year from now is about this size and costs $400, which is now the reason why every car manufacturer is scrambling to catch up. And what the Google guys knew was, well, it will take us to figure out like self-driving cars, it will take us 10 years. So we'd rather start now with this really expensive, ugly tech, knowing that by the time we hit the market, the unit will be that size, right? Mm. And I think you can do this. I, um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has this amazing saying, which is um, they have this in their little handbook. They've got this little thing they call the little red book, or blue, or whatever. Um, <laughs> I guess it's blue, I guess. Should be. Probably blue. Um, but he's got this, like, on literally on page one, he says, like, at Facebook, we know exactly what we're going to do the next six months. And we know exactly what we, where we want to be in 30 years. And the rest, we have no fucking clue. Mm -hmm. And it's true, right? Like, this is exactly what we teach our people. Like, you have to have this vision. You need to know where the future is going. And you need to know what you need to do today. Mm -hmm. But this thing in the middle is so nebulous, you just don't know. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. You had one, right? Um, so maybe this is another one of those over a bottle of wine questions. And I'm totally willing to buy that bottle of wine. <laughs> Clearly, you believe the singularity is coming. Like, what are your personal like hopes and/or fears for that situation? Because some people are like, "Oh, it's the salvation of humankind," and the other totally. people are like, "It's the great filter described in Jeremy's paradox." Uh, so, I'm curious what your thoughts on that are, and also like, clearly, what you're trying to do now to shape yeah. that future. Right. Um, so, the question was about the singularity and like what the the future will look like. So, very briefly, like just to like filter people through this, like the notion of the singularity. Um, there's actually two views of the singularity, like what it actually is. So the one says, we have a computer which is powerful enough to become quote unquote conscious, whatever that means. The other one is, and we can upload our own identity into this machine and become this like digital bio whatever combined life form. Um, Ray Kurzweil is basically of the second camp. I think the first camp much more interesting because it's a much more closer one. Um, I think there's a, um, a colleague of mine describes this with a picture which is really beautiful. It's a macro picture of an ant. So you see like full scale ant and there's a finger, like the tip of a finger like pointing into this picture. And the ant has like its little like antennas up and looks like the finger. And the way he describes this is the ant sees the finger, the part of the finger, but it has no conceptual understanding of the rest of the human, right? It doesn't know what a human is. It doesn't have any, any sense. It sees the finger, of course. The moment computers become whatever you want to call it, co conscious, that will very much be like us. Like you will become the little like ant and you will have no conceptual understanding. You will see the fa interface, but you will not have a conceptual understanding of what the machine actually looks like. I think the, the biggest common mistake people make is they think that computers will be like us, which is the reason why you've got like the Terminator running around, which is bullshit. I don't think that is true. Yeah. And um, to give you a, a taste of that future, the Google AlphaGo team tried to replicate and understand why AlphaGo made fourth game move number 38. They can't, they don't know. Because the computer is like, um, so the AlphaGo uses something which is called deep learning, um, which is kind of like it simulates the brain in the way it interacts. They cannot, you can't go back and say like, oh, in the algorithm, this is the line which made it do this. Like the computer became a, like intuitive about this particular situation and then made that move. Um, also, you can guarantee that if they were to play that game again, the computer very most likely would not do the same move again, right? right? So it's a really interesting world we're moving into. But I believe, fundamentally believe that the, the part we need to get comfortable with is like we will not know. Hmm. It's kind of interesting, scary. Do you want to do New York? Yep. New York. Uh, 
Hi. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, are we at any risk of creating a sort of growing skill-based class divide, whereby if you talk about democratizing mm. and demonetizing all these tasks, do we end up creating a system whereby only people who are high-skilled are in jobs, and you were speaking about uh, yeah. the job market only growing at 1% when we need it to grow at 2 yeah. we almost create an exponential difference yeah. between the rate of growth and the rate at which we need jobs? Yes. Yes, excellent question, and I, I would argue that's true today. So if you have a, a computer science degree from Stanford, you're golden. If you have a computer science degree from like some shitty college somewhere, you're okay. Um, if you have a, I didn't even finish high school, you're pretty screwed in this world. Um, I believe fundamentally that's true, which is the reason why I think at a societal level, which goes back to the pace layers, right? Like, Shit, like shit happens so quick here, like the, the, the lower layers are not moving fast enough. But I think on a societal level, we really need to redefine like how do we actually want to design society. Because we designed our society based on Keynesian principles, right? Like 5% unemployment is the natural rate of unemployment because people move between jobs. Like politicians in Europe still try to get to that la layer, right? They're like basically saying like, oh no, like we need to like get to this level. And it's like, it's probably not realistic anymore. Like I think we need move into a world where like higher levels of unemployment are much more common. Like then we need to figure out like what do we, A, what do we do with these people like from a societal perspective, like feed and care for them, but also like how do you give them meaning, right? Like knowing that a lot of people get their meaning out of their jobs obviously. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's some really big problems ahead of us. There's absolutely no question. Yes, yes. Um, and this, I think, is actually the biggest challenge for an entrepreneur who latches onto a trend that they absolutely believe is going to happen yeah. at some point. And it's also the reason innovation departments constantly make bets that don't pay off for them. Yeah, of course. It was a Xerox story um, at Unibilt Octane yeah. at Stanford. So Bill had Scout, yep. which, to, if you don't know, it's basically like it was a handheld device that was like a combination of Yelp and mm -hmm. Eventbrite and a bunch of other stuff, and you were supposed to carry this thing around, and like, was just a clear example of buying a future sure. that needed smartphones to be ubiquitous. Yep. And so the question is, when you know that we're going there, yeah. and you've got limited runway, yeah, absolutely. how do you think about what is the right amount of pain for the future yep. that isn't just gonna eat up that runway before it ever pays off? Yes. So Alan Kay makes a really important distinction between innovation and invention. Mm -hmm. So uh, Xerox Park invented. They built new stuff, right? Um, Apple innovates. Yeah. Apple doesn't invent anything largely. What they're doing is they're putting packaging it together and like uh, rolling this out. So you need to figure out in which place are you. So invention or innovation. If you're in the innovation space, you should not invent. If you're in the innovation space, and this is arguably is, um, like true for most entrepreneurs, um, what you want to do is you want to actually understand the problem. So the reason why like Scout didn't work is because nobody actually needed the thing. And I can swear to God, like if he would have asked people on the street right there, like they would have told him, like I don't want to run around with a piece of shit, like tell, like that's not makes no sense, right? So if if you develop like deep empathy for your user and like a deep understanding of the problem space, I think you're pretty golden. Um, and then you can still think about, okay, so what does this mean with like in terms of like what is my technology delivery? Like, do I want to give them something which is like tech, today's technology? Do I believe something in the future will happen? But the biggest problem I see with entrepreneurs on average is that they actually not know the problem space. We had this interesting, so we run this program in the summer called the Global Solutions Program. 80 students from all around the world, 10 weeks on our campus. Um, they're super, super smart. And we did this impact sprint last weekend. Um, it's kind of like a mini startup weekend thing, but you stay only in the problem space. And it was fascinating, like you have them pitch and we say like, it's only about the problem. So you pitch your problem and you recruit other people who are interested in the problem, right? People got up and they were like, here's the problem and what I need is a PHP developer. I'm like, no, right? Or here's the problem, here's my proposed solution. Like people, like we have this tendency, right? And, and entrepreneurs are really good at like finding solutions, but you need to force yourself to sit in the problem way longer. It goes back to like uh, Einstein, you know, famously said like, if I only had one hour to solve a world, like a, a, a life or death problem, I would spend 55 minutes on the problem and five minutes on the solution. Got a unique focus, right? Yep. Um, Two last questions here and then we'll wrap it up. Um, 
I had my, you don't, I don't think you forget your first real virtual reality experience. And um, thanks to you, I had one. And I think you probably videotaped me almost falling over yeah, totally. on, a, um, uh, on a roller coaster. What yeah. was that, Oculus yeah, that, that you had me try about maybe three years ago yeah. or so? Um, take me into VR and actually, actually AR. Like, where, like, like, what does that, not everybody in the room has, has kind of experienced the things that, that you yeah. get to come across every day. Like, take us to the future AR, VR yeah. world. Yeah. Um, so I personally think VR is really complicated because VR is like, it requires you to be in like, um, it shuts you out from the real world, which I find is a very interesting, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an experience people I think as humans we don't actually want, like by and at large, right? Like, Imagine you're like sitting with your friends and like, I, I've got friends who are doing uh, VR for sports events, right? Like, and it's awesome, like you try it and you're like, whoa, I'm on the field, right? But like, if I'm with my friends, we're drinking beer and like watching a game, like I cannot see us sitting there with like goggles on, right? Like being cut out of the, of the real world. So I actually think AR is the much bigger one, so augmented reality. And augmented reality can have many, many forms. So one being, I can actually transport myself into a world, but I'm there with my friends. So this goes more into the VR thing, right? So I'm like at the sports field. We all have these glasses on. We're actually in a physical room, but now we are like in, like in the same space. I see yeah. you, right? Which requires, you know, camera setups and it knows, you know, all this kind of stuff, where you are. AR, is, I'm, I'm really enamored with because AR will open up so many opportunities in terms of like um, how we enrich our lives. So anything from uh, Boeing is using AR to do um, complicated um, machine repairs, mm -hmm. where people like put on these augmented reality glasses. Someone in Seattle in the headquarters sees what they're seeing and then can paint into this picture, right? So literally like, hey, you should take this red cable and here's the blueprint and like put stuff into your field of vision. Mm -hmm. um, and as the glasses become smaller and smaller, I think that becomes like, something we really want to have. Or you're living in a world where like, you know, I'm terrible with names, for example, I'm sitting here and like, I see like every single one, like a little bubble across a, a head of you with a name, right? And then I'm kind of suddenly, hey, Carrie, you know, and then I get like, like all the information. How is your son? You know, like all this, like, there is a really interesting like world we're moving into. Like, um, it's actually interesting because when you watch these early AR videos, like even Google Glass had these like mock videos where like you see, before it was public, you see like someone putting on Google Glass and they get these like layers of information. I actually think we're moving into that world. Mm. And then, I don't know if you've seen this, but there's a, um, someone did this um, horrific vision of the future where like someone puts on AR glasses and then sees ads everywhere. Like everything becomes a freaking ad. Yeah. And it's horrible. Like you walk through the slides and like ads here, ads here, ads here. It's crazy. So it's interesting like to think about like where we are going from that perspective. But ultimately I believe like AR will become something which become pretty routine where people just want to like put on the glasses. Like my, my you know, I use Google Maps to come here. Um, with AR, it's super easy because I now can like basically can start painting the road as I need to drive it, right? Stuff like that it becomes so useful and intuitively. And, and also like to your point about like the scout, right? Suddenly something I want, right? Like I would like that. So I don't need to look down on my phone. I need to see like, did I need to take the second or third turn here, you know? That kind of any, stuff. any thoughts on, on timing of AR? So uh, you can be a big company right. with a lot, you, you know, you could be right. the Google self-driving cars sure. who can fund 10 years of development. Yeah. Any guesses, um, I'm assuming probably not, but any guesses on when an outside, not so well-funded yeah. backed startup might be able to enter that space in a time where it can meet the market in an yeah. efficient manner? So I think it, hap it depends on where you want to be on the, on the product lifecycle curve, yeah. right? As a company, right? Um, I think um, the next couple of years will be really dominated by early, um, by the early adopter market. So you've, you already have HoloLens, we will soon have Magic Leap. Um, so a bunch of devices will come out and there's an opportunity for startups to, to ride that wave. Mm -hmm. um, it will not be um, economically all that interesting because it's just very few people will use it. Um, I believe it will take us at least five years, if not longer, to get this down to like a, a point where like you even get to early majority. Um, because there's also a piece in there which is like, um, you know, like compute power that they need to become more transportable, needs to be connected, then it needs to be socially be acceptable to wear glasses um, in like more social en encounters. Um, you know, even today when you wear Google Glass, people look at you like you're crazy. Yep. Um, so it'll take a while um, because it will not cross the chasm all that quick.
Final question. You are part of our community. You've been part of our community mm. for a while. This is the first time you've come in mm -hmm. and, and spoken. You've been a, a killer design review <laughs> panelist in the past. Um, how can we help you? What, what, wow. What's something that the, the founders of these startups, both here and in New York City, uh, can mm. do, big or small, uh, to be helpful uh, for you? That's an amazing question. OK, let me think about that. So I think my purpose is, uh, so I think my purpose is, is about story, as much as I don't like the word, uh, it's about storytelling um, and getting people to move towards action because I believe that there's a lot of large problems in the world and we need to tackle them as you've seen. Um, I believe everybody has an opportunity, in particular everyone is working in media here, right? I give an opportunity to activate people around you, like use your medium to do something really interesting and good. And I know that a lot of the, like, the companies which came out of your um, former batches with whom I've stayed in contact, they're doing amazing things like you know, educating the world about really complex problems in new ways, et cetera. Um, so really keep that in mind as you're going out there. It's like you have a role. Like there's a, I think it's really important to understand that like, as a corporate, so the corporate is treated as a person in the US, as you might know, um, which is kind of bizarre. But if that's the case, then you also have a, social res like a, a societal responsibility because you're a person in, the, in this environment. Um, so just take that serious and you know, do what you need to do, but think about like, okay, so how, do we, how can I as an, as an organization do something in this world which is like moving this world towards a better general state? I can't think of a better place to end. Pascal, thank, thank you. you so much for coming in. Thank you. As a reminder, his slides uh, are available yeah, right totally over there. there. Um, you can subscribe to The Heretic. Yep. Uh, he's got cool shirts saying build <laughs> stuff that matters. Yep. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming in. So. Uh